programs, which can be a little bit misleading. Um, the word producer is part of what I do, uh, but the best way to describe it is that I build bridges between the artistic uh, work that we do on our stages and the discovery programs that we do with young people in the community so that they're in a constant reciprocal dance amplifying one another. Um, and the scope of that changes from season to season, so sometimes I'm more enrolled at a, as an artist and maker, sometimes more as an administrator, sometimes more as an educator, depending on what the needs of the season are. Bruce? Uh, I'm Bruce Seavey. I'm the Associate Artistic Director at the Denver Center Theater Company. Actually, the theater company at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. We changed our name, which, you know, <laughs> some of us older people are having a hard time hanging on to it. Um, uh, I'm also the director of New Play Development, um, so part of my job is um, normal stuff associated with associate artistic director, but I also handle the casting and um, uh, supervise uh, our New Play work, which primarily centers around a festival that we do in February uh, called The Summit, where we just uh, finished our 10th uh, summit. Courtney was there as one of our directors. Um, Hi, I'm Henry Godinez. I'm uh, the resident artistic associate at Goodman Theater in Chicago. And uh, I think um, primarily what I do is I champion uh, Latino work and help um, develop our Latino audiences. I've been the director, curator of the Latino Theater Festival at Goodman since about 2003. And um, I had the great privilege this week of working on Kid Trevoni Brings the Rain. It's been amazing. And uh, I also teach at Northwestern University, where I had the pleasure a couple years ago of directing Ms. Zeter's um, play. So um, it's been... Okay, great. Um, one of the things that came up on Sunday night when we talked about the us versus, versus them, or us and them, if you're not here, sorry. Uh, so guys, we need to speak up. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, it's just this idea of uh, adult theaters versus uh, youth serving theaters. And so part of this uh, conversation will get at that a little bit about what is the truth about that and where is there perhaps uh, more generosity flowing between those two things than we might not be aware of. Um, so I want to just talk a little about each of your theaters do work for and with young people in a variety of ways. And you know, I guess you can wear whatever hat you want to wear in terms of Goodman uh, at Northwestern as well. Um, but when if you want to just talk a little bit about people's people's life's history of, of work for young people, just so people know the work that you do. Sure. Uh, we are. I would call us a hybrid theater. Uh, our season of plays includes uh, several pieces that are intended for young audiences and uh, in addition to work for adults and that work for adults also covers a wide range from classics to new plays. Uh, we don't really do musicals at all. Uh, there are musical components of our holiday show which is a panto in the British tradition but kind of Americanized and created specifically for our resident company, which is another significant feature of the theater itself. Um, Abigail Adams is our artistic director, and she kind of held the position that I'm in for many years and was a tremendous champion of work for young people and started the New Voices Ensemble uh, about 25 years which ago. Which is, the New Voices Ensemble is? Is a, a program that brings students in from the city of Chester, which is outside of Philadelphia, and it is the most uh, economically impoverished city in the United States, and has been for several decades. Um, those students come and participate in classes and in theater making experiences with us. Uh, and. It was really to bridge the divide between where our theater is situated, which honestly used to be farmland, and our theater is built into an old farmhouse. Um, and since then, it has become a very suburbanized, very affluent area, uh, but we've continued that partnership with the city of Chester. So now some of the students that started with us when they were in sixth grade, uh, one of them is now one of my most amazing teaching artist, Nadira Beard. 
So there's kind of a, a generational carrying forward and a real commitment to that kind of long-term relationship building in all of the work that we do. So uh, my realm in Arts Discovery has multiple programs. Uh, one of them is a free ticket program for partner high schools that we've worked with for over 20 years. Uh, some of the programs are much newer. We started doing a lot more work with students that are on the autism spectrum and students with disabilities. Um, that has informed our artistic work, which I can talk more about later. Uh, but our commitment to work with and for young people has always been that as adults, we learn as much from working with young people as they learn from us. And uh, just continuing to build opportunities for that to happen where we have young people in the room alongside senior company members, uh, our best artists on our stages and uh, in our design work are also our artists that are teaching our students. We don't have a separate category of teaching artists. It's kind of, uh, you have to buy into that to be considered a member of the company. If you're not committed to working with young people, we'll still continue to cast you, but to be a company member, there needs to be a real commitment there. Well, uh, we've always had a, um, uh, a high school uh, matinee kind of uh, series at the Denver Center, but since uh, Kent Thompson came uh, to the center in 2006, and I came with him from Alabama, um, he uh, started looking at um, uh, wanting to focus on the, the age group just below that, and I'm hesitating to name it because we've used a, a number of different names, we <laughs> called it. Um, middle school um, that worked for a while and then we kind of went to family um, because we were interested in when we started doing middle school all of a sudden we found out that families were attending uh, 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 with their children and thought, this is great we want to kind of go with that um, and now we're uh, kind of saying youth um, and we're and we're also dropping the age a little bit when we were first there, uh, starting out, there was already a children's theater in Denver, and we're very aware of our um, role in the sort of uh, uh, the healthy organism of uh, Denver theater, and make sure, wanted to make sure we weren't stepping on other people's toes. However, now there isn't a, a, a children's theater in Denver, and so uh, we are thinking we might be moving into that. Um, and really, it's about our, our desire to uh, put theater into the lives of the Denver metro area people population at all stages of the game um, and uh, we I uh, to say that we're still sort of uh, we've made little sort of uh, pebbles in the pond kind of thing and seeing what to well, okay let's try this and see what happens there um, uh, we, we do something every year uh, aimed at that audience and um, and we're still sort of evaluating and seeing what, what our program will be, but we haven't named it yet. Fortunately, we didn't have to do a big manifesto to get a grant or anything. Um, so we're, we're letting the program sort of evolve um, organically, I hope. Um, one thing we certainly found out, though, is that uh, it has changed uh, for the better our, our view of who our audience is at the organization, I would say, prior to this. It was pretty much a standard uh, regional theater thing is that we were aiming for, uh, you know, adults. Um, and, you know, somebody else was taking care of kids. And uh, we don't see it that way anymore. We have kids in the building all the time. Partly we have a very large uh, uh, academy program and there's a, a building that has you know, two floors dedicated to classes that are happening uh, continuously through the year. Um, uh, but uh, also, this so the, the move for us to uh, be uh, targeting a certain age group or whatever it has uh, been, uh, we didn't uh, put it in a separate uh, uh, silo. It actually was part of our season. Uh, we scheduled it differently so that uh, we could uh, take advantage of schools coming. But then uh, we had uh, it was part of a season ticket, um, and we used all our. You know, design team and directors and uh, all the production budgets were the same, and so it, we've never kind of put it over off left or anything. It's, it gets uh, full attention, and it's been interesting because a lot of the people who have been with the Denver Center on staff now have kids that are this age, 
So it's a great thing for them, you know, that they actually get to attend with their uh, children. Uh, as far as uh, types of plays that we've been doing, we started out uh, working with uh, schools very deliberately and because they're sort of the gatekeepers, at least in Denver, of how you get people in this particular age range. And we are kind of aiming at, what, fourth grade to eighth grade, I guess. Denver Public Schools, there's a lot of different versions of what happens between elementary and high school and what it's called. Um, uh, title recognition is a big part of what these teachers um, seem to, at this point in Denver, uh, what works. Uh, other pressures, and I don't know if this is common everywhere, are like, you know, what time the buses have to get back, and <laughs> this is like big. And, uh, you Your know, most friends. Yeah. <laughs> We call what we do uh, Theater for Young Audiences, QIA. We've actually only used that contract once. Uh, we, the rest of the time we've used an equity contract because it just, uh, it worked better for our, what we wanted to do with that particular play or who we wanted to cast in it and how much we wanted to rehearse it. Um, but I, I so, blah, blah, blah. I just want to just jump in here. Some of you know this, and I just want to make sure we're clear about this. So our, our three panels are all with Lord Theaters, uh, legal resident theaters, um, which are regional theaters, uh, and they all, in their unique ways, are serving youth, and that's part of what we're getting out of the different ways. Obviously, we're going to leave a lot of time here for conversations so you can ask more in-depth questions about what they do, the kind of work they do. And we'll also focus here in a little bit on how they develop new work, since that is our focus here at right now. And we'll talk about that in a global way, new work, and then down to is there a difference between developing new work for young people and developing new work for their grown-up audience. Um, but I think, uh, for me, having worked at both of their theaters, they're very different institutions, and their relationship to uh, young people, I would say, is different in terms of the way it's integrated at least from the outside. I think People's Eye has a long history of deeply integrating that. The roots are very deep with young people being given a lot of responsibility in terms of the playmaking and the generational thing that happens. Yeah. And I see that Denver uh, is, uh, is doing that in a new way for you guys, yeah. which may not still be sort of in the Yeah, so you're still figuring that out. So, you all may have some great ideas for Bruce yeah. about how they could do that. <laughs> so since we're sure. beginning with all that. So Henry, you want to talk a little bit about what you did? Oh, uh, actually, sure. I'm Henry today because I forgot my name. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be so young and good looking. At least for a day. Such a gentleman. Um, well, at, at Goodman, for many, many years, we've had a, a really terrific uh, education community program. These days, for a while now, led by the amazing Willa Taylor. And uh, that included, for like eight or nine years, um, my heading a program with what is now called the National Museum of Mexican Art in Pilsen, uh, working with a group of young people from the community for six weeks every summer, developing skills and many pieces uh, where they performed and presented for their community. Sometimes they were scripted plays, um, sometimes they were adaptations, sometimes they were devised pieces. It was really cool. Um, we don't, per se, have uh, a lot of producing that we do of theater for young audiences. Um, as a freelance director, I've directed for Chicago Children's Theater, um, including their inaugural production of The Year for Frog and Toad, which we produced or presented at the Goodman, um, along uh, also with a, a, a couple years later with a production of Esperanza Rising that I directed for um, CCT. Um, most recently, we've been working very closely, and uh, within the Latino Theater Festival, it's always been important for me to include theater for young people or families um, from, um, you know, international productions. So we've hosted uh, Brazilian companies, Mexican companies, um, uh, and generally they were nonverbal pieces, you know, pieces that depended heavily on music and movement. Um, so that language wasn't an, an issue. Uh, with the exception of one Mexican piece, a puppet piece that we directed that was very heavy language, uh, and we supervised. But um, 
I also am on the board of directors of Albany Park Theater Project, which is an amazing company in Chicago. It's, it's, it's a teen ensemble, but they're led by incredible professional artists. Uh, David Viner is the co-founder, executive producing, artistic director. Um, and we hosted them, we presented them in the festival um, in 2008, I think, for the first time, and it was humongous, and uh, so much so that we invited them back to the next festival. These were one night only uh, presentations, and then we realized we have to let more people see this. So, so now we've been presenting them in the summer for a couple of weeks, and the Goodman now has an ongoing relationship with APTP, where we present them um, for a couple of two, three weeks every summer. And this summer they're remounting a production called Feast. Um, it's a device, they, they devise work. I don't know, how many of you know about Open Park Theater Project? So you've got to research this company, they're incredible. Um, they create one, one show a year. Um, they, the youth ensemble interview, they decide on a theme, they interview people in the community that have to do with that theme, and then they spend the year devising, developing this play. Um, and it's it's remarkable. So, so for the Goodman, that's um, I think that that's kind of the core of what we do in terms of theater for young audiences. I wish we did more uh, theater for youth and theater for families. What was great about the Edge of Peace, Susan's play that, that we did at Northwestern, is that's what I really consider theater for. It's family. You know, I mean, I, um, the subject matter is not. Um, you know, it's not super light, it's, it's, it's intense. You know, it deals with war and death and loss and uh, a lot of things. And we had a great time producing it. And, and I, I feel that that's the kind of theater that we could use more of, is theater for families, so that parents and children, young people can, you know, in the car on the way home, talk about, you know, some pretty heavy duty themes. Great, great. Um, so let's talk about developing new work if we can, since we're all here uh, hoping to, to do that ourselves, to learn more about that. If you can talk about, and if, you, if you can uh, slant it towards work for family audiences or for young audiences, however that fits into your programming. Um, but I'm also interested, um, what are some of the mistakes that you've made along the way that you that you learn from that you can pass along to, to the rest of us? in those trenches as well. So, any one of you want to talk about developing new work? We haven't done a lot at this point, and we are on the verge of sort of uh, moving into that. Uh, we really started out with uh, high recognition titles of, you know, existing things like Diary of Anne Frank and The Miracle Worker, and we did the Tom Sawyer that Laura Beeson did, and what else? Cobalt's um, uh, uh, The Giver. So we've been oh, we've been using a lot of material that's out there already um, uh, in terms of building this audience, and um, uh, that's been successful for us. But we know we're going to run out of um, number one titles. Um, but also, we're excited about the idea because we, we have such a uh, healthy commissioning uh, program right now for uh, our new work, um, adult new work. I guess we don't really call it that, but um, uh, that we are. Uh, thinking that's what we will do. We, we have commissioned uh, uh, Eric Schmiedel, who was here yesterday. Um, uh, he's been working on an adaptation of Frankenstein for us, and I think we see that as something that we will be doing. Um, the title recognition thing, I'd be interested. I'm, I'm here as much as a learner as a, a I'm here as a learner um, <laughs> in, at this conference, um, uh, because we do find that um, uh, the title recognition thing is sort of big. If they haven't heard of what the play is already, or it's not uh, based on some book or something that's in the curriculum, perhaps, or something, um, very, uh, it changes the way that it reaches the audience uh, still for us. And I, I hope, I imagine that will change over time. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what your experiences in that have been. But I think commissioning is going to be our thing. Uh, we're really struggling to shift the, the tyranny of the title. We really created a monster with uh, going through a period of putting a lot of resources into the adaptation of popular stories for young people that were familiar, that were on library shelves. And what we're discovering is that because of the fragmentation of uh, ways of learning 
So in our area, we have public schools, we have a lot of private schools, we have a lot of prep schools that are specifically geared toward getting those kids into college. Uh, we have a lot of homeschool networks, and we also have a lot of cyber schools. So we're, what we're finding is that the reading list is totally all over the place, and it's not as consistent as it was, I think, even five years ago, where we would see a novel like, uh, like Goot on every single reading list for seventh graders. So looking at that landscape and recognizing that that's probably only going to continue and amplify, thinking about how can we still continue to connect with stories that are familiar, and then also develop an appetite for taking a risk on new work. So we kind of have two, two distinct pipelines. One is uh, what I would call when we inherit a relatively new work. So a couple of years ago, we premiered Y York's adaptation of Stargirl. Uh, if you haven't read that, it's beautiful, and you should, um, both the novel and the play. And then right now, we are going into working on Robert Schenken's adaptation of A Single Shard, which Seattle Children's Theater did. So this is the East Coast uh, first production of that. Um, so people are familiar with that book title, but not that play. So what we're doing is uh, we use our summer programs for young people. Our biggest is one that serves about 80 fourth through eighth graders. And we use the story that we're gonna have on the season the following year as our seed material to go through a devising process and then those students create a response piece that is not a retelling of that story in that same way, but pulling those themes out and then using that through improvisation and playwriting to create something new. And then we invite the community and their parents to come and see it. And so we're starting to build an awareness of and an appetite for that kind of work because then we try to give those parents tools to activate them to go out and be advocates for us to other parents who can kind of explain, oh, this is what devising is. Because there are a lot of, you know, there's so many people that you say that word and they look at you like you have two heads and they're like, so which musical are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the other reason for going about that process is we've always been a very improvisationally based company of actors and artists and also because there's an egalitarianism in that where uh, we don't find that as much in already existing scripts where there are a handful of really meaty roles and then everybody else is you know, in the back being a tree. We want everybody to make a meaningful contribution and to find their own story reflected in what is created together. So that's the one pipeline. And then the other is, uh, I guess the best example of this would be our recent work with the National Theatre of Scotland on what we've loosely called the work project and is now shaping around this title of shift. Um, so a couple of years ago, Abby was talking with Simon Sharkey of the National Theatre, and they were out at the picnic tables. Those of you that have been to People's Light, you know this like grassy knoll in between the two buildings in the summertime. The picnic tables are out, and they were talking about meaningful work and what is meaningful work, and what happens when meaningful work goes away, or when you shift careers, or when you retire, and then you're kind of reinventing your identity, or you're underemployed, and you're seeking work. And so we went into a community-engaged process of working with different communities to gather that information. Uh, my role in that was to take that same program, that summer program that I was just describing, and we worked from the myth of Sisyphus. Really light, fun material. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, we struggled. This was difficult because we were working with students that were not in a workforce. So how are we going to talk to them about meaningful work without just going to school, which is not the same thing. And what we discovered after making a lot of mistakes, particularly in the first week and the kinds of questions we were asking and the improvisation prompts we were using, was that they were reflecting back to us their experience of their parents' journey through work and what their perceptions were of that. 
and grappling with things like they want to spend more quality time with their parents, but they also want the latest iPhone. And both parents need to have jobs in order to live that level of lifestyle. So how do you put those two things together and just working through those kinds of uh, juxtapositions and finding story through that. Um, so that's kind of, those are kind of the two models that we're, that we have uh, playing back and forth at the time for new work. That's a, that's a great thing. I want to, um, want to change this up a little bit just because of the nature of this, uh, the, the time of day that we're doing this, but you just brought up something and I'd like to open this up to just some impressions very quickly. And that is what, what is meaningful work? What makes work meaningful? Let's just call out things. What makes work meaningful to you? <clears throat> Discovery of new things. Discovery of new things. What else is meaningful about work? Helping people. Helping people. That it has resonance beyond selling a ticket. Mm -hmm. yeah. Making real connections. Mm -hmm. The opportunity to crack something new. Opportunity to crack something new open. Yep. Deep emotional connection. You want to do it every day. <laughs> Forging new relationships. Changes the way I think. Okay, so that's all you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is for you. I also want to just mention there's something I want all the playwrights and, and producers to hear. When Bruce was, first of all, Wendy, it sounds amazing the yeah. things that people's lives are doing, and I think it's a great model. And I think we will uh, want to know some more about that, both in this panel and outside of the panel. Um, it certainly sparked a lot of things. This idea of a response piece as a way to build interest in something is really, I think, is a fascinating. Yeah, where do you, how do you develop appetite for new work? Mm -hmm. Right. right. That's, a, that's a hard question. Yeah. Appetite building. Appetite building. <laughs> so another thing I want to say is that Bruce um, was being a little modest, um, and I wanted all the writers here to, to, to hear this so Denver Center Theater is, he's saying, the guy who's heading new plays out there, new play development is saying, we're going to start moving toward commissioning plays for young audiences. So this is a huge shift and a huge uh, new opening. So you're going to have thousands of playwrights, of course, <laughs> I'm not going to do more. But I just want to say, as a recent uh, commission writer for Denver for a play for grown-ups, um, the thing that's so impressive about what they do and why this is exciting for those of us who also have an interest in, in young people is that the commissioning, I'm going to do my version of this, you can correct me, but um, at least in the last few years, they've commissioned four writers a year. Um, and then you go through a very healthy process, which includes sometimes uh, being part of the summit, which is a, now a two week long development process with audiences, with several different kinds of audiences, um, that both Denver audiences, national audiences. There is no uh, verbal feedback, it's all written feedback, so the writer has power to interact with feedback in ways that's most useful to them. But also, um, two seasons ago, they premiered four new plays on their season out of the 10 that they did which is a huge, huge thing. And so they're on to something, so I have to believe that they will be able to figure out how to do new work for young audiences as well with that kind of track record. So do you see a connection there? Are you, totally. can, I mean, yeah. let me ask you another question then. Will, if you commission a writer to write a play for young audiences, do you see that play being part of the summit? Uh, you know, the only yes. thing right now is logistical, you know, in yeah. terms of can we cram it into the weekend kind of thing. But uh, yeah, yeah, we don't really make a big distinction already between uh, uh, who the target of the work is. I have to say, too, we, we, some surprises that uh, were surprises for us. We started this program for middle schoolers. Um, 
and then found out that all these adults wanted to come with it. Uh, we put out this study guide for middle schoolers, yeah, yeah, and the yeah. adults were like, you know, well, I want the study guide, you know, we had to like print like way more of them because they wanted it. We found out that, you know, our target audience was not necessarily what ended up being our audience, yeah. which I thought was sort of great. Um, and that there wasn't in the audience's mind a big uh, shift. We just did a production of Lord of the Flies, right? Which we was we were aiming at sort of, I don't know, it's middle school exactly, but you know, middle school to high school. And the adults were, I would say, as ravenous for that play as um, uh, the young people were. And they were going together, and that was a great audience dynamic that there was that, um, the, having young people and adults in the same audience, I think, is yeah. great. Yeah, and I really, what I'm seeing a lot of is that plays that kind of hit that middle school age, that fourth through eighth grade, they are, there is a multi-generationality to that. And I, I think it has to do with, with, the, with the brain of that age of the young person, where there's still a playfulness there and a great imagination, but there's also, you know, there's wonderful cognitive reasoning skills that are developing. And so when you are hitting that sweet spot, I think you're also opening a wider conversation that can include parents. Like one of the great uh, things about several of the plays here this week um, is that there's a complicated parent relationship that's happening in the story as well as uh, a difficult relationship for a young person. And so there's something relatable for both. But mm -hmm. I think there is something about that, that fourth through eighth grade sweet spot that does you know, we're finding many more adults are willing to buy in and go see that, and they have a great sense of fulfillment from it, which is delicious. Mm -hmm. And from a producer point of view, I think parents feel like they should get their ch child to go see that play of that great book or whatever, but they end up staying and enjoying the experience as well. I mean, it's, it's an, there's an interesting tag along. I, I don't know what else to call it, you know, what happens. Um, the one thing, though, I, we, we are going to do some more commissioning, but in talking with, um, Janet the other night, and um, also I'm very aware of what um, Linda Hartzell's been doing at Seattle Children's and stuff. There's such a body of work out there already. I think uh, James, you've written uh, a number yeah. of things. And um, uh, so I do feel like partly um, uh, we just need to, um, the compendium of all this work that's been happening over what seems like the last 20 years, or maybe more than that, uh, of uh, playwrights writing for uh, uh, young people audiences, there's a lot of stuff out there. Well, I would also say for all the writers in the room, I, I, I'm sure every writer here has a play who is looking for a second production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we all, I think we all know it's a lot easier to get a commission than it is to get a second production. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality of what we do. So whenever theaters say, what can we do? I, I always say, do a festival of second and third productions. <laughs> because there are so many of those out there. And what also theaters forget is, you actually get a bigger, a better script a lot of times if you're not the first theater. Because as a writer, you can calm down. It's not the premiere anymore. And so in some ways, you get to do more of the heavy lifting the second and third time. So you're absolutely right, and I think there's an exciting connection to be made. I wanted to ask you, Henry, in terms of the work you do, um, when you work, like this week you've been working on Mark's play, do you approach it? Uh, this is going to sound incredibly naive to everybody out here, but let's just put it out there. Do you approach it any differently than you do when you're working on a, a new play that was commissioned by the government that was for adults? What are the nature, what's the nature of the conversation that you have about a new play for young audiences? You know, I, I really don't. Um, and it has to do with what something that Wendy said. Because I, I first thing I learned, um, uh, you know, when I started directing plays for young people and then being a parent, is that um, kids are really smart. Um, you know, and, and if we think about it when we were that age, we, we thought we were just smart as could be, you know. Um, so no, I don't, I don't approach it uh, any different, really. Um, you know, I think that this week in the room, we were asking the same questions that I asked about any new play um, during the developmental process. Um, so, you, you know, I, 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 I have to say real quickly that, you, you know, the, uh, at the Goodman, you know, Rock and Bob had this thing about not really liking to, you know, try to Rock fit things. Rock and Bob are 
Who? I'm sorry, uh, Bob Falls, our artistic director, and Rod Schulfer, our executive director. Um, you know, they, they really try not to, um, you know, to invest too much in, in labels and boundaries and boxes and things. So, so they kind of disregard those things and just do things that they feel are important and appropriate at any given time. So while we don't necessarily specifically have a theater for an audience's program, um, we've been producing Christmas Carol for like 30 years now, and it's something that, that we take really, really, really seriously. It's something you've directed there many times. And I have. I, uh, it was kind of my, uh, my entry point as, uh, as when I first became an artistic associate for six years I directed it. And, um, you know, it, it's it's really important for us. So so in the casting, you see uh, the city. You know, it doesn't it doesn't look like I'm willing to bet uh, Dickensian in London. Um, you know, but it looks like Chicago, and that's important to us. And and you know, there are generations of families and young people that have grown up with that play, and now we're bringing their children to see it. And and you know, they learn about uh, redemption and morality and hunger. Read and you know, so it's an important thing for us. Um, um, you know, we have our great friends, Howard Gordon, and our friends at Steppenwolf have mastered the art of the adaptation of um, you know, young adult literature, so we don't even go there because they just do it so good. <laughs> um, but we do other stuff, and I think as a community, then hopefully in, in Chicago, we touch on those things. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that one of the cool things we've done uh, through the festival is partner with the Lark Play Development Center in New York City. Um, and their U.S.-Mexico Playwright Exchange is an awesome thing. And there are many young pl or plays for young people that have come through that. Um, and it's, it's this unknown gem of a secret that you should look into. If you know John Eisner uh, and Red Tome at the Lark, um, there are a lot of wonderful, you know, uh, translated plays for, for young audiences that, that are flying big time into the day. So for the writers in the room, Diana, are you here? Because you yeah. had went through the LARC uh, Playwrights Week, right? I did, yeah. Uh, so uh, just I want everybody aware of the LARC in New York. You can, it's open submissions. You can, uh, you do what you want to talk about that a tiny bit? Just yeah, the LARC is the so amazing. It's like this little oasis. In they the don't produce the work, they only yeah. develop work. They only develop work. They have a really great little writer's room that's a locked room, and only writers can get the code. Um, and you're not supposed to talk in there. Um, so it's really great. Like, And I asked them, I was like, so when when I'm like back in the city, can I just like come write in this room? And they were like, sure. Um, so they're super, super generous, and they do tons of programming. So um, I mean, a lot of programming is for writers who are based in New York, but you know, I'm not based in New York, and I was, I've been there twice, um, yep. and they're really cool and great. And Andrea yeah. is, like, super awesome. It's just another resource, again, I think, when we talk about isolation and not being aware of what's out there, um, it is another place. Susan, yeah. Another uh, thing that everybody ought to be aware of, if you're not, is the National New Play Network. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept of rolling premieres. Yeah, which Diane also just which said. Which yeah. also did one. But I just think, you know, once again, if we're looking at the second, third production, the idea that there is a developmental path. Yeah. You know, you talk about what's the developmental path of the play, but there's a developmental path that happens after the premiere. So then there's another premiere, and another premiere in geographically very different states. I think this has been a godsend. It and it's something that I wish there were more of in TYA specifically. Yeah, I'm mean, going to think again, staying the obvious to the writers and directors and dramaturgs and producers in the room and designers in the room um, and publishers in the room. Um, <laughs> everyone in the room. <laughs> um, is that, um, when we talk about new play development, it, we're talking about through three and four production. Yes. We're so, we have to be so focused on getting that first production because, of course, we don't know what the hell it is until, can I say that on, uh, on, uh, 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 until we get into a rehearsal room, until we get into front of audiences, but it just continues. So that's the hunger for these continuing life of our plays. Um, it's a, it can feel like a real burden on writers because you're stuck with these characters who are living inside you, who are dying uh, for more voice for more opportunity. So I do want to open it up to the room. Remembering just we started with, so this us versus them thing, I think 
we've, we've talked a little bit about how there isn't as much us or them, but I, I, wanna, I want you to be able to ask these three people, how is there an us in them, or where you sense an us in them, if you have that, um, to, to get into that conversation, to sort of start to satisfy uh, the desire to, to really wrestle with that idea that we talked about on Sunday night, or any of the other ideas, or any other thoughts you want to have, or you want to offer about uh, commissioning and developing new work for your audiences at the theaters. Who'd like to know anything? I have a, yeah, for Henry, um, you know, uh, talking about New Albany, sorry, Albany Theater Project and how it lives in uh, in the Goodman. And I think a lot of times, and this is something that came up in 2013 right now, that um, we want to figure out how to way, ways to do new programming where we don't exhaust ourselves, right? That it's like re-energizing. And I love the idea of the invitation for Albany to be there. And I just I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about how you negotiated those resources or, or Goodman staff buy-in on that and... Sure. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, I think we're really good at, at knowing what we, what we do well and what other people do better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the case with all the Part Theater Project. Um, you know, we understand that they are uh, um, doing work and addressing an audience that we want to address, but that we don't, that that we can't do within the confines of a big, you know, regular season, uh, subscription season, and and you know, aesthetically they are excellent, you know, so they 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 basically touch on all of our core values: community, excellence, um, and uh, there's another diversity, you know. So so it. You know, it, it, for, and since we got to know them through the festival, um, it, it was it just became a, a natural relationship. Uh, and the buy-in from the staff was easy because the staff just saw the work, saw how amazing it was, saw the difference it was making in the lives of these young people. Because not only do they produce like incredible work, they also tutor these high school students. They guide them through the college application process. Uh, we actually fly them, pay for them to go and visit colleges and universities. About half of these students are undocumented, so we research the, the colleges and universities that will offer them financial aid. We, you know, and who's the we? Who's doing well, that? I say we because I'm on their board, but yes. really it's the staff, the Open Park Theater Project, it's David, and then, you know, it's, it's a very what small What is Goodman's part. interaction with that part of it? With that part of it, really none, other than supporting it, um, you know, through you know, donations from the staff as individuals, um, um, or just, you know, when, when we present them, we, you know, we uh, go and advocate the funders on, on their behalf, and, mm -hmm. and that's what makes it possible, you know, for them. Mm -hmm. But no, that's all APTP does mm -hmm. that. It's just that we morally support it, so we find, you know, um, we, we have no problem, I should say that Goodman has no problem my sort of like approaching our, not sort of, actually approaching our trustees, our board of trustees who have seen the work or who haven't about continuing to support ABTP um, because obviously those people are, you know, high caliber people that this little tiny theater in the northwest side of Chicago, you know, one of those trustees makes a huge difference to them. So, so in that way, the Goodman has been super generous in opening you know, the doors. Mm -hmm. Great. Else. I wanted Wendy, as you're thinking of questions, I wanted Wendy to talk about the autism uh, issues that you're developing, facing, solving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we have two long term residencies that have been, uh, one's been in existence a little over seven years, one a little over ten. Um, and one is serving a public elementary school in Paoli called General Wayne. The other is serving a private school uh, called the Pathway School in Norristown, which is a very uh, also economically depressed area, but it serves students that are uh, experiencing uh, physical, cognitive, and behavioral challenges. Um, so our Associate Artistic Director, Pete Pryor, and our Resident Director, Samantha Belomo, are in residence at the Pathway School. 
Uh, I'm in residence at General Wayne along with Susan McKee, who's our lead teaching artist there. And we work with those students uh, for a full year from year to year. Uh, and what we are discovering there, it's, it's kind of uh, the opportunity to be in constant laboratory mode for how individuals with those unique attributes receive theater. And what are the things that we can do as artists to make that experience more accessible to them, more enjoyable for them. Um, so I, the, the tightest model, like the most compressed example would be in the fall at General Wayne, we, uh, we use the, the panto, which usually opens just before Thanksgiving. Uh, so for example, this past year, it was The Legend of King Arthur. Mm -hmm. Arthur and the Tale of the Red Dragon was the title of the panto. Uh, we started with General Wayne in September, and the entire fall, we were exploring that story. Uh, one of the things that our students struggle with is story sequencing and also in anything that is abstract and not concrete. So how do you take non-literal, introduce it in a literal way, and then open that up and expand it? Um, where they have most impacted our work, I think, as artists, is in the necessary clarity in order to communicate effectively. So there is nothing extraneous. Susan has shared with me that she feels that her acting has become much more focused and dynamic because she's not wasting anything. Because for us, when we're with those students, if, if we're using anything extra, it is a distraction that could derail an entire session. Mm -hmm. So we gotta be lean and mean. Uh, <laughs> so that kind of specificity of focus is really important. And then we invite all of those students and their families Many of their siblings also are somewhere on the spectrum or they have what are called sibling echoes, mm -hmm. where they have a certain sensory processing thing that's similar to their sibling that's actually been diagnosed um, with autism. <coughs> so they come with their families to our invited dress. They become our first audience. This is hugely important for us because it gives us the opportunity to take a play that's never been seen by an audience before and have it in real time and space with young people, with their parents, with the audience that we hope will come to get feedback while we're still in a place where we can make changes and adjustments. We are also adding sensory friendly performances to that production that keep the house lights up at half, at least throughout the production, gives everybody a lot more space. So if somebody needs to get up and move, uh, because they need some kind of kinetic stimulation during the performance. It's totally okay to do that. Um, they have taught us how to be better artists. They've taught us how to have better hospitality. Uh, they have taught us, they've taught us how to be better human beings. Um, so to have that resource built into programming has been hugely important mm -hmm. in our learning curve on how to serve <coughs> what is an ever-growing population. Yeah. Well, when you're talking about you four are in residence at these schools, can you just unpack the mechanics of that? Is that a, who's facilitating that? So uh, we have great buy-in from our partner schools. Um, do you mean facilitating as in who's actually there and how frequently? Yes, and who's okay. paying for it. Got it. <laughs> Uh, so both programs are funded in part by the Pennsylvania Commission on the Arts and also by donors who make general donations to arts discovery programs to that umbrella. So it does pay for part of my salary, Pete's salary, Samantha's salary, it pays Susan's fees. Um, sorry, that's Susan, I will call her Susan. Um, and we're at General Way once a week on Mondays for about an hour and 15 minutes each day after school because we cannot go in during the school day because that would take away from instructional time. Uh, and then Pete, and Pete is a full-time staff member at the, well not full-time, he's a staff member at the Pathway School. So he teaches there regularly uh, because 
theater has been hugely important uh, in developing social skills. Um, and if you're interested in the studies that we've done with a couple of with speech pathologists that have done a very rigorous documentation of the impact, I'd be happy to send those to you. It's a really exciting study we did a couple of years ago. Um, he is there, I think, about three days a week. And then Sam is in as much as she can be with her rehearsal schedule. It's a couple hours each week, but if she's in production and she's in rehearsals every day, she's there less. So it kind of, it's a balance between their rehearsal schedule at the school and our rehearsal schedule at the theater and who's available when. So they, uh, they also, they do public performances at the Pathway School. We do more private performances at General Wayne, mostly because there's not a performance space there other than a very large classroom that we work in. So, and are the projects text-based <coughs> or not? Or, or is it they are not text-based. Okay. It's all improvisation. We build up to text, but many, uh, many of our, especially our students at General Wayne, uh, have extreme difficulty expressing emotion and reading emotion. Uh, many individuals with autism have face blindness, so they aren't able to read facial expression and determine the meaning behind the words you're saying. So we work with that a lot, and that's one of the reasons the panto is so helpful, because it's a very exaggerated performance form. So a lot of it is improvisation-based, and then where we are now, is actually on the phone with Susan last night during the Playwright Slam, because she called in a little bit of a, uh, we're in the midst of finishing, devising their story, and we, we scribe for them a lot. So it's their words, but we're doing the actual physical writing because either their fine motor skills are not there yet, or they are, they're more comfortable expressing themselves through drawing. We do a lot of drawing work with them to tell story, and then have them tell us about the drawing and describe that. So it's much, it's very little text until we get to the very, very end. I love a couple of things about this project. I love an ongoing relationship that exists between a specific school community and the resources that are there with the educators that spend time with these students every day. And I think that's a really important piece to looking at how you invite a community into your theater. There's a lot, I imagine there's a lot of behind the scenes advising that. We have amazing partner teachers who do, they take what we do on Mondays and they really thread it through their whole week. And I know that that's a blessing that not everybody experiences when they're an artist in residence. So I also think the other thing that's resonating for me right now is the conversation that we started on Sunday night about how do we look at the submission process in a way that gets us away from uh, verbal linguistics. Mm -hmm. And I think a couple of resources that are really great um, is that I know the Kennedy Center, first of all, the Kennedy Center has a great, really practical booklet on sensory friendly performances. I'm sorry, say that again. The Kennedy it? Center has a great, really practical nuts and bolts booklet on sensory friendly performances, if you're interested in that. The other thing that the Kennedy Center has is a playwright discovery program for middle school and high school mm -hmm. playwrights, and yep. their submission process is intentionally and specifically really diverse. You can submit CDs, you can submit video, you can submit drawings, you can submit any kind of media to represent a play. Um, and, they, and you can also submit not just as a single writer, but as a group up to, I think, eight um, writers together as, as a group playwright. So in terms of broadening what this community might think of in terms of submissions, it, when your, your thoughts just kind of spark my thoughts in terms of I think that community might have a lot to offer us and how we can diversify what we think of as an element. Yeah, you just triggered something else that I should share is that for, for several years, the residency at General Wing was funded by BSA out of the Kennedy Center. And they have changed their guidelines somewhat since they were funding us, but they have, I think, eight different categories for funding uh, for specifically arts organizations who want to work in communities uh, with individuals with disabilities. And the, the grants can be incredibly generous. So that's a great resource in terms of looking for funding to start or sustain programming. Um, and also just as a resource, the VSA has been really, really wonderful.
I also want to connect some dots here. Um, the theater that Wendy's a part of, People's Light, uh, Wendy's sort of a continuing connection uh, between right now and People's Light. Uh, Abigail Adams was the keynote speaker at the then Bonderman, probably close to 20 years ago. Um, the artistic director who you've mentioned, who's such a visionary about integrating uh, the lives of young people with the working artists. Um, it's, they've been nationally recognized by so many awards. And also David Bradley, who was in, uh, the associate artistic director, has directed uh, here many times, as well as he the He says IRC. hi to everybody, by the way. <laughs> so this is purposeful in terms of us co continuing this relationship with this great uh, knowledge base that, that Wendy brings to us from People's Life, which is really one of the leading programs of uh, doing work side by side and really together. And also, my observation, it was one of the first times where I saw a company of grown-up actors who were doing both work for young people, families, and adults, and there was no difference. There was no difference in pay, there was no difference in, it was the thing they were working on. Yeah. And I was so, that, that was a huge step up for me as a writer to experience that. The so. resources committed to our work for young people, it's, they're the same resources that are committed to anything that we do. So there's not like a second yeah. tier funding. So I grew up in the UK at the age of 12, so like going to the Panto was for me and like for many young people in the UK, like that's your introduction to theater. And, Absolutely. Um, and then like going back to the UK as, a, as an adult and going with like, uh, you know, um, young adults of mine and like experiencing that as, a, as an adult theater maker now, which is fantastic. But um, I know a lot of like retail producers in the UK, like the Panto might be the only sort of more family friendly show that they do, but um, I have some colleagues that work at the York Theatre Royal, mm -hmm. and they talk about their panto in terms of being like, for many people in their community, like the only time they'll come to their theatre, yes. and that's okay. Like they acknowledge they may never come back again, but that's that's a good thing. And it seems of like the, the the sort of success of those productions as well, like it's it's incredible. And um, yeah, I think it's just like that that history, like a. I'm, I'm, I'm always kind of uh, surprised that it hasn't sort of taken up so much because I think there's so much about that that it'll, in addition to being family friendly, sort of this great sort of subversive history and like the mm -hmm. use of drag, like yeah. having young people see that in early age, like I think is so cool and exciting. And, uh, so. It's a it's a hard. I I I have one foot on each side of the fence because on one hand, a panto is everything that Coleman Jennings and Susan Zeter taught me not to do <laughs> <laughs> as a theater maker. <laughs> And then on the other hand, it is a low-risk entry point for people who have never experienced theater before, or that it does become their holiday yeah. tradition. And uh, and so I am grateful for the positive things that it that it's done for us. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to return to what uh, Susan said and maybe get some more um, responses from you about like the idea of Rolling World premieres and um, how I, I am taking that they, they're not really being, it's not really being applied so much to TYA. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you guys could like speak on that. Um, is that, is that anything like, is, is it, is it is that, does that seem like a cool idea? Is it on anyone's radar as like a possibility for, you know, um, you know, um, working with TYA plays as opposed to adult plays? I've been on their ambassador board for three years, which, you don't get a stash or anything. But. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of the things. You're on the board for a national board. board. Yeah. 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 Although, great. like, you don't only have to do Rolling World premieres through that much. I guess they do fund it, but like, there's other people. People do Rolling World premiere type concepts without. Um, it's a good question. I don't know if they ever have ever have had a um, TYA script. Um, you know. I don't know, but um, I think it's terrific. The concept yeah, is such a good mm -hmm. concept. Yeah. They just, uh, I think, us, Dallas, and um, a few other large theaters have joined uh, mm -hmm. NPM this year as associates or something. Right. I'm not quite sure what that uh, entails exactly, <laughs> but I, I would see no reason why. Uh, uh, I, mean, I just don't think there's this big dividing line between, oh, kids are going to come see it and adults are going to mm -hmm. see it, really. I, I feel like it's an opportunity that, that just, we just need to you know, make happen. Yeah, um, and, and it may not always look the way we think it 
does. You know, in other words, it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, Goodman, Denver, and People's Light. Mm -hmm. You know, Susan, I'll use uh, Edge of Peace as an example. Um, I think the university uh, world, the academic world, has a lot of possibility for us in this way. You know, uh, at, at Northwestern, we have this huge student theater scene, humongous. Um, and within that, there is a very established theater for young audiences called Purple Crayon Players. And now there's even a splinter group that does specifically, you know, I, I went to a piece this fall that one of my students was in for, um, you know, young people on the autism spectrum, and it was the most moving, remarkable, I just can't even talk about it because I'll start crying, but, um, you know, when we did Edge of Peace, um, it, you know, Susan, I don't know if you should speak to this, but we did it at Northwestern, then I think it went to Austin, and then eventually right. Seattle. Yeah, well, basically what happened again, with, especially with the big shows, it's often very hard to get it onto that production uh, schedule. So Linda Hartzell, in an incredible act of grace, actually said to Reeves and to the folks, you guys can do the first production. You know, and we will actually call the, you know, premiere will be when Seattle finally can do it, but because they couldn't put it in their rotation mm -hmm. early enough, they, we were able to do that in conjunction with Northwestern and a, in terms of the AATE conference that was happening oh, at the right. same time. Right. So there was that kind of urgency. But then when we finally did get the time to be able to do the actual quote unquote premiere, it was a co-production between the University of Texas and Seattle. And what they were able to do then is that Linda sent five equity actors from Seattle to Austin, and they augmented with the rest of the cast from the MFA program, including the fabulous Fran Dorn, who was the head of the acting program, the MFA acting program. And it was a wonderful coming together of student actors at the top of their training, of the equity actors from Seattle, and um, uh, you know, a truly a co-production that that was fabulous to be able to pull us together. I think one other thing about this rolling premiere. I mean, I don't think we should make it, with the number of playwrights in this room. Don't make the assumption that the NPN network is not for you. That's right. You know, they can't do it if you don't send them. So you know, not on the door. I'll take that a step further and say because, for instance, at Goodman, we have in terms of new play development, we. Uh, through Tom Palmer, uh, who's our fabulous director of play development, we have something called the Playwrights Unit, where we, um, she has four playwrights, generally thought of as local Chicago area playwrights, who develop a play throughout the course of a year, um, you know, and they, they work together every month, they read from each other's scripts, and then they're given a professional director, professional cast at the end of the year to do a workshop and a stage reading. I mean, it's. It's really a great process. And then there's new stages where there are submissions and we do uh, every fall readings and workshop productions. And, and, and so I would say don't assume that those sorts of new play development programs, you know, don't, aren't interested in your, in your play for young people right. and families. I, I think, I, you know, don't wait to be invited. I'd say yeah. just go. Crash the party. Yeah, crash the party, <laughs> totally. <laughs> I just want to seat us back to the 2013 right now gathering in Tempe to say we spent a day and a half with Jason Lowith, who was the former executive director of NNPN, talking about how we might be able to create a similar kind of model or infiltrate that model with theater for young audiences writers. So we did some beginning kind of spade work and part of why we wanted to do some us and them in this conference to, was to start to unearth why, what are some of our barriers to keeping at that. So I think as an industry, we want to keep focused on this. How do we build up more momentum for the kind, either, either rolling premieres or co-productions, whatever you want to call them, collaborations between academic and professional. But how do we keep the energy moving about that conversation? And part of it is, don't, what Henry said, don't wait to be invited. I think that's probably the, the, the greatest way we can parse it out. Um, it was interesting for us because we, 
There was a funding opportunity that came up from US Airways about six or seven years ago, maybe a little longer. But um, they just put out an RFP and said, we want to do something special with the arts. And they didn't really know what it was. And so we submitted a proposal with People's Light and Charlotte Children's Theater to do second productions of world premieres uh, where we would share them. And so we did, um, uh, while York premiered um, Getting Near to Baby at People's Light, so we did the second production. We premiered Dwayne Hartford's um, Tale of Two Cities, which then went on to People's Light. Charlotte didn't really play well. Um, they just collected the check. Um, but but it was a, a fascinating, and funders sometimes don't know right. what opportunities are out there, and you know they were U.S. Airways was looking for hub city things, but it turned out to be a great experience mm -hmm. um, um, for for us, and we collected a lot of money from it, so it was great fun. That's great. Yeah, Carol. Yeah, well, I'm I'm looking for the hope and the sea change that's happening with Lord Theaters because I obviously the representatives who are here sure. are doing it. And I think there, there, we heard the glowing stories of significant action in your communities where the work with young people and for young people is not second class, it's not ghettoized. So I'm wondering at board meetings, are fellow board members who are not in the room noticing? Are they paying attention? <laughs> are, because it's not only good work, it's also good for marketing. It's good for future. all those connections that need to happen as the same audience. Right. Uh, I'm just going to respond quickly, Carol. Yeah. Here's the oxymoron about Lord meetings. <laughs> Who's at them is the managing directors, who right. are wonderful, but they're doing collective bargaining conversation, not programming conversation. Okay. They are doing some programming conversation, but principally through marketing and development. So it's much more uh, a, a it, it, there's some big oxymorons in how that so meeting say, structure functions. Jane. I just got back from her. Yes, she did. <laughs> this is our general manager, Jane Robinson. Yeah. 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 I will say, because we've just been on the phone with uh, several um, uh, caucus conversations because the TYA equity contract is up for negotiation in June. And there were lots of Lord uh, people on the phone um, wanting to make it easier, mm -hmm. wanting equity to make it easier for us, to, for Lord Theaters to do more, which I do think in a way does speak to programming from a managerial point of view. Mm -hmm. So yes, so that's conversation helpful. happens a lot. Yeah. That's helpful, right? Well, yeah. As a writer for Young Linux, primarily, I was really, um, I love 100% and I you know, don't wait for an invitation. However, there are a number of opportunities that explicitly yes. prohibit Young yes. Linux. Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder if it might be an advocacy to change that and to say, there really doesn't need to be, sometimes I've actually contacted opportunities, and they said, well, as long as it's not that kind of play, then uh, submit it. And I wonder if there's an Sometimes I think we just don't tell them it's for Young Linux. Yeah. 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 Just submit it as a play and see what you get. You know, I, 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 Mark and I were actually talking about this earlier this week, and, you know, first of all, never take no for an answer. Uh, you know, so, so um, what I, you know, advised uh, Mark to do is to, when you come up against something like that at a big, you know, lower theater, a big institution, look for an advocate, look for a champion within that institution that might be open to your um, to your work, you know, or to or or to that that need, and have them advocate on your behalf, you know. Um, th that's that's what we do at the Goodman, the associates. You know, we we go to Tanya, or we go to Bob or Rock, and we go and look, you know. That's that's my job. That's what I've been yeah. doing, you know. And sometimes I feel like I get paid to be frustrated, but that's my job. <laughs> <it's> to just, <laughs> fist on the table and say, no, we need this, we need this. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But what's cool is they pay me to do that. So so find those people and say, look, uh, you know, in the instructions or in the rules it says, you know, TYA, but this is an awesome play and it's, you know, if you frame it this way, could you do that? And I think it's a matter of labeling, too. I mean, I think if you don't send it, you don't say, is it okay if I send this, it's TYA. 
You know, uh, I, I was struck, I was in the uh, Humana lab this most recent time, but the time before I was struck at about how many plays in that Humana festival had a young person at the center. You know, are they de defined as TYA? No. But, you know, it was like half had a young person at the center and nobody was calling that TYA. And that's not denying our profession. No. I think it's working. I mean, I think ultimately my dream will be when we have those, that category disappears. Mm -hmm. Because we aren't saying we're, we're different, we're special. Where every theater would automatically include the youngest and the tiniest butts of the seats <laughs> among, <laughs> among their uh, audience. And you know, I was said when I taught in a children's theater program that my dream would be the day that there wasn't such a thing. And it's not going to happen until every single theater in America embraces the totality of the age range of their audience. I, I've been I'm getting that signal, but I want to say one last thing to Raina, who I, I don't know that we really addressed it, because I, one of the us's and them's was that sense of I'm at the beginning of my career, and there's all these people who already have the ins. And I, I think it is difficult. I just want to acknowledge it's difficult to make it on your own, and, but I think you have to, you're doing it by being here this week. You know, it's so much about relationships and about building relationships to people's work. And so the conversation has started for you and your play, and you just have to keep that conversation going. And invite, invite three theaters to do your play. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody for uh, spending some time.